Billy Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for making time for this. I have lots of questions about the band, about your career as an artist and more. But first, I have to ask the important question. What happened to the good Charlotte Civic? Man, you know, like, uh, I know we've had a fun little back and forth about that. I mean, I have no idea. If somebody wins it, it, it goes on. I'm sure it's been sold and resold multiple times, but I love it's like a rare Bigfoot sighting. Someone will hit a picture like, I found the Civic somewhere. So it's cool that it's still existing somewhere. But yeah, I don't know. I think there's a couple of them, actually. Yeah, there is. There's a Paramore one. There's the, or you mean multiple Good Yeah, like I think ones. there's multiple Good Charlotte ones. Oh, so it is like Bigfoot then when I remember being devastated when I was a kid and I found out that there was more than one Bigfoot truck. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's I, like I my whole say world is a lie. Maybe two, maybe three or four, maybe something like that. But I do think there's a couple of them out there. Interesting. But yeah. I, I mean, I joke about that, but like it just was so wild to me that this kind of music got so mainstream that you know honda civic which is the most mainstream thing For on sure. the planet yeah was you know th and they weren't just putting their name on the flyer they actually you know made these cars with these bands uh, how did you feel about that at the time i mean obviously that was like a pretty whirl whirlwind kind of moment in our career um it was just I mean, of course it was cool. You know, we had like a, a car with our band on it and we, that was our first arena tour as headliner. So that, I mean, it was a big deal for us for sure. But um, it's so funny because I think when you're in the moment, you know, I was, I felt like a kid then, you know, I was so young and like, it's hard to uh, understand the moment or like really appreciate the moment until years later, you look back and you're like, man, they made a, a Honda Civic with my band's album cover on it. Like, and somebody drives it like it's crazy. It is. I mean, and you guys were all over MTV, you know, TRL and all that stuff. I mean, I guess from talking to other people who were kind of in that situation, it, it seems like it's pretty hard in the moment to even really kind of process what's happening. How did you feel about that? You know, you're like, oh, we got to go to New York and do this huge, you know, appearance on TRL and all that stuff. Like, were you able to process that at the time? Not good. Not as well as I could now. You know, it's kind of funny just you don't appreciate things as much until they're not around anymore. And you think, wow, that was really crazy what we're doing. But um, it was just all so fast. I mean, I was a senior in high school when we signed to Epic Records, you know, and I literally oh, wow. went from being a senior in high school, like straight on tour um, after graduation and just like never stopped. I mean, so back then, like you said, it's like, hey, we're flying to TRL, but we could have been like in the middle of the tour somewhere. And you fly to New York, you do TRL for two days, and then you fly right back to the tour the next day, and then it's another day. You're back and playing a concert that night. So it was just kind of nonstop back then. But, you know, when you're in your 20s, your body's good. You can do that. You don't need sleep. Like, you can just keep working hard. I mean, now I wouldn't quite want to live like that. But back then, like, we just said yes to everything, and it was just like, go, go, go. I think that idea of saying yes to things is so powerful. And, and you know, I talk to a lot of people now you know, especially like creators and stuff like that. And they're, it's like, they're very picky about, they don't want to work with this sponsor and they don't want to do this and they don't want to do that. But then they're also frustrated that they're not kind of getting the results that they want. And I'm just kind of like, well, you say no to so many things. What do you think is going to happen? Sure. I think you have, to, it's like different uh, chapters of your career when you can do that. At first, when you really, right. when you're new and you don't have anything and you want it really bad, you better say yes to everything because you don't know when people are going to stop asking. Like, sure, once you've established yourself and you've made a, a certain level of success, you can start picking and choosing what things are important or how you want your brand or yourself to be viewed. But at first, unless it's something really like, oh, this is really against what I'm into, like, sure. But right. for the most part, you kind of got to say yes. You got to work, you know? Like, I think that is the thing with a lot of young artists is, they're like, are waiting for things to happen. I'm like, you don't wait for it. You go get it. Like, if you don't go get it, it's not just going to be handed to you. It's not, you know? And there's so many things, at least for me, so many things in my career that I thought weren't going to be cool and ended up being cool and vice versa. You know, like when I was younger, I really wanted to work on like, you know, skateboard videos and stuff like that. And I did, and it was okay, but I didn't make any money. And the people that I worked with mostly sucked you know, because they were just these like dick face skateboarders that were like impossible to work with. But then I did some stuff for like Tide and Febreze and Swiffer and stuff that I thought was going to be really lame. And actually it was awesome because the people involved were really cool and I got paid well. And it's like, I, I don't know what your experience is, but I feel like 
you really never know what's gonna turn out to be cool until you do it. And really quickly, I also wanted to mention my Patreon. If you like what I do on YouTube and everywhere else, joining my Patreon really helps me do this full time and worry less about videos getting demonetized by YouTube or copyright claimed by labels. Patrons get all my podcasts and main channel videos early. There are members only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I also do giveaways. For example, I've been giving away a lot of Emo's Not Dead merch. And you can also have me review your music, artwork, or anything else. All you need to do is join my Patreon at the $10 level. And then every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post. And then I will review it live on Twitch. So if any of that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And I appreciate your support. Of course. I mean, everything's touring is so glamoring and you get in your uh, glamorous and you get in your first tour and you show up to the venue and you're like, what? There's one bathroom for all like 20 people <laughs> backstage and my shoes are stuck to the floor. And you're like, this is disgusting. You're like, well, that's your life for the next three months. Get used to it. You know, right. for the so, next sure. 15 years. Yeah, right. You think it's three months and it turns out to be 15 years. Luckily, the backstage has got a little nicer as things went on. But sure, when you first start out, you're like, oh, this is not what I thought. Yeah. Uh, well, one interesting thing that just happened uh, is, so you guys played when we were young, yes. and you brought out Lil Wayne. Yeah, we um, did. Which, yeah, people seem pretty excited about that. How did that happen? You know, like, honestly, this was our first show in close to five years. We haven't played since, you know, we, d we did like a, a friend's wedding and stuff like that, but that didn't really count. That's just sitting in a room with people, you know. This was like a first real show that we've done, and four and a half, five years or something. And we thought, man, if we're doing this, we're going to go big. You know, let's, we want to bring production. We want to show people like what we can do. And we just thought, you know, let's go out with a bat or let's, let's come back with a bang. And we're like, who, what's like an icon? Let's something we could bring. And we just, everyone, we love Lil Wayne. I mean, he's such a legend. Yeah. And, um, I thought it would make, you know, we thought it would make good sense for that crowd. And uh, just had our manager ask his manager, like, Hey, you into it? And like, Right away that day, he comes back, Wayne's into it. He loves the band. He already knows the songs. Tell him when and where he'll be there. And we were like, oh, shit. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this is great. So, and he was super cool. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like people were really excited about it. They were. Yes. Yes. It definitely was like, you know, we kept trying to keep it a secret because we knew it was coming. You know, we we're just like, oh, wait till, you know, people. And he didn't show up even on the, the, the venue grounds until like just before he went on stage. And no one saw him hanging out or no one really knew until like he just rolled right up, came straight up on the stage and did his thing. So it was cool. It was a good moment for us. I mean, he's not known for being on time. So I tell you this, though, we rehearsed with him, too, like before. Okay. He showed up 15 minutes early to rehearsals. Uh -huh. He knew everything. He was super prepared. He had everything okay. memorized. He knew right where to come in on the song. Like, you don't get to be that big if you don't, like, understand work ethic a little bit, you know? So, sure, I'm, you know, he has his moments, I'm sure, but I was super impressed with everything that he yeah. did. We were all like, man, that's why he's a legend. Yeah. You guys have always kind of had, like, I don't want to say necessarily, like, one foot in hip-hop, but kind of, you know, in a time where that sure. really was not common at all. Um, where did that kind of come from? That's just because we love that kind of music. Um, you know, I think, you know, we grew up in Maryland and where we live in Maryland, you've got like Baltimore on one side and DC on the other side. So you have like two major cities within like, you know, 30 minutes of either way. And, um, you know, hip hop just dominates the culture there and, and all the radio stations we grew up, all our friends at school. Sure. There was a couple of rock stations, but I feel like hip hop just dominated everything. Um, and we just always grew up listening to it. We still listen to a lot of it. Um, that's just a, a part of our sound. And I think you're right. We never wanted to be like, a, you know, like a punk rock rap band. That wasn't like the goal right. or anything. But for sure, like that was just something that we all loved and listened to. And um, whether it's like the style that we dress in or maybe a little bit in the music or just the approach to rhythms or lyrics or or just things. And stuff in, in the in videos. General. Yeah. And it was always there. A lot of the aesthetics. It was just like, we were like, let's think of a video. And I think, what's the coolest video? And like, I'm thinking like, oh, Dre and Snoop, like, that's the cool videos. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. let's, like, I'm not thinking, I don't know, like Motley Crue, like, no, that's not a cool video. You know, like, that's not the look for me. Yeah. It was always like, you know, 90s rappers. That's the coolest, you know? So when we came time to do the anthem video, we're like, let's just have like a big party video, like all those, you know, and, and just do our thing in it. Um, So, yeah, really, it was just because we just love that, you know, it's just part of us. Right. Yeah. And back then, you know, these days, of course. I feel like there's sort of this whole TikTok pop punk thing where it's like rappers doing pop punk and vice versa and, you know, everything downstream of MGK and, you know, Travis Barker obviously sure. having a huge hand in that too. 
But, you know, 20 years ago, that was really not a thing. No, not at all. Um, and it's it's funny to see things kind of like come full circle, I guess. You know, I'm thinking like now when I see people come out doing things. OK, so obviously you made that history of Good Charlotte video or whatever you did. That's how I kind of first got put onto your channel. Um, and no, I guess a little before that. But it was really good because you, you hit the nail on the head on so many things back there that that. That, that that I don't think we were doing that possibly maybe influence where that went. You know, it's, it's, I think it's just a matter of, and you've probably said this before, it's really expensive to be in the studio to record a band. You know what I mean? To go in and get a full drum kit and bring your whole band in the studio, it's expensive, but it's really easy for a kid in a laptop to program some drums in. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to plug your guitar into your computer. So like the kids wanted to make pop punk, but they couldn't make full bands. So they just kind of took trap drums and put pop punk guitars and started rapping and singing. And, and I feel like that genre was sort of birthed out of necessity almost like this is just what we have so this is what the sound's going to sound like and other people are like oh i like this so i think that was just like a natural progression of of influences coming together and just given what you you know what was there you had places to do upload your music sound clouds and streaming and you had your laptop and it, you know i think it's more of a not necessarily where the music sound came from but just what was put in front of that era of kids like this is how we make music and it was cool i, I loved that boom i thought it was really cool there's a lot of really good music that was coming out of that sort of 2010s era rap in fact i was listening mm -hmm. to so much more rap than rock during that era because that was where all the exciting music was happening absolutely i i think you know rap from say 20 14 or so to 2019 to me was like one of the most exciting eras of music like 100%. basically after Fetty Wap came out and SoundCloud started to be the thing and then you know 21 Savage and Lil Pump and yeah. you know Yachty and all those people and Future like that was like such a crazy I was like whoa rap is really fucking out there now this is cool yeah I mean I I, I was I mean, I had been kind of getting into producing and co-writing around then, and and I was really into just making beats and stuff. And it was cool because I, I was sort of learning how to just make, you know, cool trap beats, and I was into that style. And then all of a sudden, like, this sort of pop punk influence, guys like Juice World and Peep came in, and, like... Right. It's it's almost like the 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 um the world just handed it back to me like oh you're making beats well everybody wants pop pumpkin beats and that's what you right. know how to do it like it's all it just you're all kind of lined up like oh okay like great so it was a good time for me to sort of get into that because a lot of people started coming to me and I was like hey I've got trap beats and they're like do you have pop punk and I'm like you want pop punk and I'm like yeah that's what I want I was like okay I was like I was trying to get away from that you know I was it's like you do this your whole life you're like oh that yep. shiny thing over there looks really fun I was like I've I've been doing rock forever and. I love hip hop. I'm just going to focus on this for a little bit just to try something different. It's like the farther I try to get away from rock, I was like, nope, it pulls me right back in. Like, no, no, we, we want more of that. So I just think it's kind of funny when life lines up like that. Yeah. What are some of the things you've done as a producer? Like, I know that you have done that stuff, but I'm, I'm not. Yeah, super you know, like I did like a track with Lil Xan. I did one with Brendan Savage. Um, okay. A bunch of the guys in that kind of world. Um, there's a Shinigami. I know you've had him before. Yep. Uh, me and Shinny did like we did like a whole new metal project, really, like a six song, just new metal album. Um, another artist named Boy Band. He kind of started in that Internet money camp and kind of broke out as his own. And then this artist from the UK named Kid Bookie. Um, he's sort of mm -hmm. like a cool. rapper turn rocker. He's really good. We did a whole EP last year. So um, I started out kind of just throwing beats at everybody I could, because before I was like the thing you say, you got to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. But then people would just snag these instrumentals and start releasing songs online that say produced by Billy Martin from good Charlotte. And I'm like, Ooh, now my name's all over these songs that maybe I don't want my name on. Um, yeah. So I kind of started shrinking that down and just started picking and choosing. Okay. I like this artist. Let's let me send just stuff to this guy. And so it, at the beginning it was a lot of experimenting and just trying new things. And now I've kind of honed it into just, uh, just doing things that make me excited. Right. So how active are you as a producer these days? Uh, you know, I, I know you said we're going to bring up the artwork. Like, I would say like 50-50 between whether I work on art or work on music. Um, I've kind of uh, pivoted a little bit into composing for like video games, TV mm -hmm. and stuff like that. that. That's something I'm really, really into. Mostly because I'm in my 40s. I have kids. I have a family. I can't do the like 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. studio sessions like like a lot of the rappers are like, can you come in at 10? Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm going to be going to bed by 10. You yeah, know? I like, can't stay awake until 10. I work from <laughs> 9 to 5 and I've had guys be, I'll be like, can we do 10? And they're like, 10 a.m.? I'm like, yeah, can you be in the studio at 10? And they're like, bro, could we do 12? And I'm like, sure, but I'm leaving at 4, <laughs> you know? Right. 
so so working doing the composing stuff is nice because it's just me by myself on my time and i'm still getting musical outlets so a little less working with other artists like um kid book he's got a new album coming out soon i think i got three or four tracks on his record um so not quite as much but um i, I still love it it makes me really happy and people always say what are you gonna pick art or music i'm like i can't pick like i truly love right. both so much that i wake up every day and some days i get to draw some days i make music and like that's the that that's a win-win the american dream right there you know yeah well you mentioned that this was the first show you'd played in five years or whatever w what is the status of good charlotte now well i mean i would say now that we did that we're gonna do more for sure um it was one of those things where We've all got kids. We're all at home with our families and you just get comfortable in that life. And especially with COVID, we just were at home for two years every day with our kids. And then life started opening back up. And we thought, man, if we do Good Charlotte again, it's going to be like a <clears throat> like a record scratch moment. Like everything stops the dropping the kids off the school and, you know, and picking them up in in sports and all that stuff. Like it all changes. So I think we'd been hesitant to like dive in because we knew what sort of a disruptor it would be but we also mm -hmm. like miss doing good charlotte um and we, we kept talking about it like hey next next spring let's do some shows and then next spring would happen and we wouldn't have anything booked and like hey how about next summer we're like yeah we should do some shows next summer and next thing you know it's next summer and and you know so we talked about it for a while and then the when we were young thing came up and we saw all the other bands that were going to do it and we're like okay we, we would be so sad to not be there like all of our friends like we have to do that so so we booked that. And um, now that we did that, you know, we got all the gear out, you know, we we rehearsed for like a week. And so we, it's kind of like we, we pulled the bandit off. And we're like, OK, there's no sense in stopping. So so now that we've done that, we're definitely looking to um, to get active again soon. We don't have any tours booked. We don't have a bunch of stuff to announce. But like, yes, we're going to keep doing Good Charlotte. It wasn't just like a one weekend thing. We're, we're definitely going to get back and and just do it at our own pace. Like we're not going to go on tour for 300 days a year. Like we want to be there yeah. with our families. But we also miss, you know, we, we still love each other. Like we've been a band for over 20 years. We're still close. We, we all get along really well. And a lot of bands at this point in their career, they show up in separate buses and separate dressing rooms. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just weird. And like, Don't it's not talk like, and right. all that. like, we're all still cool. And it's in, uh, it was great this weekend. All of us had all of our like wives, kids, like grandparents, aunts, and like, like it was insane. The dressing room <laughs> when we were young was like complete chaos, but we had everybody we wanted to be there and everybody was just smiling and just like a big family. So yeah, so we're going to get back to it. I wish I had something official and exciting to say, but there really isn't yet, but uh, there, there will be hopefully soon. Well, I think now's the time to do it. You know, like if it was five years ago, not to say it would have gone badly, but I think that would have been a little too early. Sure. You know, it feels like this is the right time. Yeah. You know, I think so too. And we also didn't want to ride the wave of, oh, pop punk is cool again. Let's hurry up and make a new record and do pop punk. Right. It's, you know, I think Good Charlotte has also like just loosely fallen into the pop punk category. You know, I do. I don't think that we're like the most like straight up cliche pop punk band. Sure. It's the one that we fit the most in probably. Um, but we kind of want to stay in our own lane and do our own thing when we want to do it, how we want to do it. Not just because it feels like we're supposed to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think especially, you know, after the first two albums, I wouldn't say anything after that kind of neatly fits into, you know, pop punk. No, definitely not. And I think we always wanted to keep changing it up. And we all listen to really different music. And that's the thing is, like, I don't listen to pop punk. When I first started playing in Good Charlotte, I had like dreadlocks down to my shoulders and I was wearing like full Adidas suits. Like, yes, Finn, I'm going to say the word. I'm total new metal head. Okay. Okay. As much as I love your channel and everything you say, I'm always like, oh, I agree. That's what I say. Like so many things you say, I'm like, that's what I think. But then when you dog on the Deftones, I'm like, oh, Finn, that's like my favorite <laughs> band. Like we we miss on that, you know? So I grew up as a total new metal head. Like in, in my favorite three bands are Korn, the Deftones and Silverchair. Like those three bands for me okay. are, are my three most important bands in high school. Dude, Silverchair is really underrated. They're I haven't so listened underrated. to them in probably 15 years. And I heard them the other day. And I was like, damn, this band was so good when they were like kids. Yeah. And if you follow their career, I don't know if you've seen like what their later records sound like. I mean, it's insane. They I've have, like, heard them, but no, I don't, I don't really remember. Okay, well, like I keep saying, I'd love for you to do a deep dive on them one day because I'd love to hear your perspective. Okay. But definitely one of those bands that kind of fizzled out in America, but in Australia, yeah. they just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, And, you know, the, the the hardcore fans who followed their career is insane. But, you know, either way, like I, I joined Good Charlotte because so I was in another band at the time that was sort of like a new metal, like grunge band kind of thing. And Good Charlotte was just a four piece. They didn't have a second guitar player and our bands would play shows together. And they'd always be like, oh, quit your band and join our band. And I'm like 
no, like I'm in like this tough band, you know, and, like you guys write these <laughs> pop songs, but I would always think like, God, they're so good at song. Like songs were so yeah. good. Like some of the songs on the first record, they had been playing since like the very beginning of Good Charlotte. And I just kept thinking like, man, this, the grass is, you know, like the grass is greener. Like that would be fun to try that out, you know? So, so I first, you know, I joined Good Charlotte. And I had this big giant pedal board thinking I was like head monkey with all these weird sound effects and they're playing pop punk. And I've got like my wall and my phaser out and doing all these weird sounds. And then we kind of looked at each other like, this is weird, but this is cool. You know, like it kind of sounds different. And, you know, so then we go on tour and like, I didn't listen to Blink. Like our first tour was Phoenix DX, New Found Glory uh, and Lefty. I I didn't know who they were. Like, I just didn't like even the sound, even that pop punk sound. I remember New Found Glory came out the first day and I was like, what is this new sound? Like, this is crazy. You know, and people are like new sound. Like, so it's weird. Like so you're I, too good for it. You just, yeah, I just familiar. didn't listen to it. Like I was all yeah. just like, you know, I didn't know stuff like lag wagon and no effects and all that stuff that was like, uh, so, so sure. You know, I would get ripped in interviews all the time. People would try to test our punkness all the time. Uh, and I would be like, I'm going right. to fail. You know, like I don't know <laughs> the answers. I just don't. Cause that's not what I was into. So it's it's just kind of funny. Like I don't even know what tangent I went off on, but uh, I had to get to the new metal thing at some point. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, all roads lead back to new metal, especially when they it do. comes to millennial nostalgia. That's why I love your channel. You give me all the new metal <laughs> content I can get. That's right. Hey, listen, new metal uh, paid for this house, so I'm not there complaining. You go. Well, I, I always wondered. You know, speaking of that. It felt like, uh, I think I mentioned this in the video, but it felt like you guys were almost like a boy band in the sense of like kind of having these personas, you know, there's like the punk guy and the goth guy and the skater guy. Was that like deliberate or did you guys, is that just like how it worked out or what do you, what, what's your yeah. thought on that? Not deliberate, but not not deliberate. It's definitely just who we were. Like exact Benji was like all about punk. Like his favorite bands were like Rancid and like that was just his shit, you know? And like I was into like corn and nine inch nails. So like I had like the eyeliner and the gut, like that was just mm -hmm. my shit, you know, like that's what I was into. And um but at the same time, we got signed in 2000 when in like the peak of, of boy bands, you know, and like that's all how the record labels knew how to market things. That was just what right. was hot. MTV uh radio everything was dominated by boy bands and like we came along and they thought like okay like this is sort of somewhere in between because they don't look like scuzzy gutter punks you know but they don't look mm -hmm. like they you know they've got some tattoos they've got piercings you know like they're wearing eyeliner so i think the record label saw it as like okay we could work with this but they definitely were like marketing it like how they knew how to market it so i think it was a little bit just our personalities were what they were and the record label was like, Ooh, we can sort of double down on this and and use this to our advantage. So it, it definitely wasn't like, Ooh, let's each pick a persona and do that. But the label thought, Ooh, we kind of like what there is here. Like, let's see what we can do with that kind of thing. I kind of wish that it was like a calculated thing where you guys were yeah. like having a debate, like on a whiteboard or like, no, right. no, I want to be the goth guy. Right. Yeah. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> it's funny because it like a little bit when I first, when we made the first record, I had long dreadlocks and the record label was kind of like, that's not the look like blink has short spiky hair you know we want we did a couple shows with lit that was like one of the very first things we did like lit was wearing like bright colored dickies and short hair and the label was like is there any chance you want to cut the dreadlocks and i was like no you know and they were like please can you cut the dreadlocks and i was kind of like okay fine like right before our first album cover like we're you know we're all fanned out like with the on the album cover with joe's got the mic like i cut my dreadlocks off like five days before that you know and i like spiked it up and did like the uh mark mcgrath like bleach tips and everything because that was just yeah. the look and uh and then immediately by young and hopeless i've already got like long hair and eyeliner but like I, I was like i'll give it to you for the first record to try it and right away i was like no this is stupid and, and kind of went back to to how i wanted to look so i i that's one of the things that i really liked about that era is that it was kind of like i guess i'll call it like pg-13 you know and then you guys were on trl like literally standing next to 98 degrees or whatever, yeah. you know, and, it, and, and, you know, I grew up like in the, you know, quote unquote, real punk hardcore scene or whatever, and that stuff's cool, but it's like kind of exhausting to be around like that kind of like edginess all the time. And like, honestly, just a lot of like really dysfunctional people with like sure. serious, like personality disorders and mental health issues and stuff like that. And so when Blank and Good Charlotte, Newfound Glory and stuff came along, I was like, okay, this is a little bit more my speed because like I don't want to be around like gutter punk drug addicts that are like in and out of jail all the time. Yeah. 
I think for us, it was like, um, I think the word rock star started to get a negative connotation. You know what I mean? Like rock star people would be like, oh, that guy's being a rock star. It wasn't like, oh, he's badass. And like, check him out. I was yeah. like, no, he's being cocky. Right. He thinks he's too cool. Like he's treating people bad. Like there was a thing where like rock star. So I feel like in that early era of 2000s, there was sort of this like anti rock star movement where you just wanted to like kind of, you know, be like a regular person and not this. But, you know, at, at the same time, it was still larger than life because we weren't like the type of band who got up there with like jeans and a t-shirt with like you're staying on it from lunch like what's up you know like we, <laughs> right. we thought you know i mean like like helmet is one of my favorite bands of every time but every time i go to see helmet i'm like oh come on like tr tr try <laughs> try a little harder like even but, as a fan you, know? you probably wouldn't recognize them if they were exactly behind you right and that's like, oh, i love this band but like you're putting on a show you're here to entertain like get up there so so sure you know we would do our thing and get on stage and make sure but there was a certain level of just rock starness that we just like didn't want to come across as and i think there was a lot of that sort of it wasn't sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the 2000s. It was like, you know, hanging out with your friends, have a good time, and make yeah. music that makes you feel good. It was just it was just different, you know? And that's always like, you kind of always go against the era before. You bring the things you like from the, the era before you, and then you kind of change what you didn't like about it. And that's just the way, you know, the music industry works. Right, right. Another kind of, I don't know, flagship moment for me for uh, Good Charlotte was being in Not Another Teen Movie. Uh, what was that like? And that was before, like that was honestly before we had any hits or anything. That was really oh, was early. It? On. it was. It was before TRL and anything like that. So that oh, I didn't know that the movie's producer just happened to be friends with our manager and was like, "Hey, we oh. need a band for for a, a scene in the movie." And um, yeah, that was still like early on our first record, like before we had any hits. And I thought yeah, that so, was like years later for some. No, reason. no, it was like if you look, I think that came out in two thousand one, and like the anthem of Lifestyles Rich and Famous didn't come out till two thousand two. So that movie was before all that. Just okay. it was a friend of a friend got us hooked up, and they needed a band. Um, and we were signed and stuff, and there was a little bit of a yeah. buzz, but we weren't like you know a popular band. But it was cool, you know. We got on set, and you know, like Chris Chris Evans was there, like uh, Jamie Presley, right, and like a couple other you know mm -hmm. people who um were names in the industry you know and uh it was a cool experience it was really cool we showed up we knocked it all out in one day um but that was definitely a moment like oh shit something's happened like we're in a movie now like you know this, yeah. this is crazy and that was a big movie do you feel like that did a lot for you mm, i'm not sure maybe i think later as the band got bigger and people realized that was the band you know like that maybe connected some dots for some people but no, I think the biggest thing that did something for us was being in the Madden football game, like the video game. Oh, okay. Like people come to us all the time and be like, "Oh, what, what what's your band?" I'm like, "Good Charlotte." And like, "Yo, Madden the Anthem." Like always, that was reaction for so long when people would be like, "What's your band?" So, I think you know I, when I think about moments back then, that definitely was a big one. But I'm not sure. I feel like a Teen Movie was a cool stepping stone, but like had it come a year later, it could have maybe been way bigger for us. But um, you know, it was still fun. Yeah. It's interesting how big games were as a marketing vehicle back then. And I don't get the sense that that was necessarily deliberate, but that was sort of at the moment in which video games became really, 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 truly mainstream. They weren't just sure. for like dorks anymore, especially stuff like Madden and Need for Speed, you know, racing Tony and sports Hawk, I mean, type Tony stuff. Hawk music was crazy. Yeah, that too. And then Guitar Hero after yep. that, like there's so many bands that, you know, that's how they broke, you know, was through games. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it was huge for us. And I don't, like you said, they were like, Hey, your, your song's going to be put in a football game. We we're like, sweet, you know, having right. no idea like what a major impact it would, but yeah, no, I still see like in YouTube comments, like, yo, this reminds me of 2003 Madden or something like still people <laughs> relate good Charlotte to like when they were playing that game back in the day. Yeah. And people played those games for like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. Absolutely. And think how many times they heard your song right. just like drilled into their brain. Imagine if it know? was like streaming royalties every time they played the game, you know, someone's got to work on yeah. that. So how did that work then? You get like some just like a licensing paltry fee. license. Yeah just, yeah, just licensing fee. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk sure. about the art stuff, because for yeah. anybody who doesn't know, you have really like this whole second career as an artist i know you've worked on a lot of big stuff like star wars and spider-man and a lot of other stuff i'm probably not even aware of so for anybody who may not be familiar can you kind of give us a rundown of that side of you yeah um before i played music honestly since i was as little as i can remember it was just cartoons and comics i'd sit in front of the tv just drawing cartoons or copying comics and i thought like this this is what i'm going to do in life is i'll be an artist 
And then at like 15, I got a guitar and I was like, okay, screw art. I'm going to play music. And I just totally like switched gears and was obsessed with music. And it it worked. You know, I'm very thankful because I, I love it. But then you get out on tour and you only play for an hour a day. The rest of the day, you're just like, what what the hell do I do? So I kind of thought I'll start drawing again. It's just like a hobby and, and sort of pick that up. And you just remembered how much I love both. So I, I'd kind of always done a little bit of both you know I, I did a lot of like early merchandise um like the third album cover and all the artwork inside it for good charlotte i did and um you know co-directed some videos did like toys for the band like anything i could do with art related and then i started branching out of that into just trying to get into working for other comic companies and and um what the the best thing that happened was probably i don't know whenever good charlotte took our, our hiatus maybe it was like 2010 or sometime around there when we decided just to put Put Good Charlotte, you know, we all had young kids and we didn't want to go on tour and everybody was tired. And we're like, let's just give Good Charlotte a break for a little bit. We thought it was going to be a couple months. It ended up being four years. Um, but in those four years, I thought I don't, I don't have to like split my time anymore. I can dive in full on in this art thing. So I started just really focusing on trying to get my skills up on, you know, I had a lot of friends be like, yo, dude, like you should reach out to Marvel or Disney. Like they would give you work because you're in Good Charlotte. And I'm like, really? Like, why would they hire a guitar player? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I would think that like the guy from Good Charlotte wants to work on our comic. Like, right. Like we already have all the best artists in the world. We yeah. don't need him, you know? And, and that's what I try to tell people. Eh, just because my name might have some value or clout does not mean that the people who are buying the comics give, they can, they don't care about the band. So right. I knew I just had to get my skills into the on par with the other best artists out there. So I just really worked on getting better and getting better and then started you know, submitting and pitching to these companies and little by little, I got like small jobs and they got bigger and bigger to the point where like I, I got work from Marvel and Disney and Nickelodeon and um, yeah, just kind of worked my way up the ranks and show them that like, Hey, I'm not just, I think a lot of times people from other industries come in, they just want to stamp their name on it. Hey, I did a comic book, but really somebody else did all the work right, and I just put right. my name on it. And I was like, no, no, no. Like I'm going to put the 10 hour days in where I'm drawing all freaking day until like, uh, you know, the same amount of work the other guys do. And, I started doing doing Comic Cons. I'd get booths at Comic Cons and I'd go meet fans and show my artwork and meet the other artists and meet the publishers and the editors and just really try to like show them that I'm I'm one of you guys. You know, like this is it's a it's a passion for me. I really love drawing. It's not just like a, a new thing I came up with and little by little just started meeting people and, and working my way up in the industry. And nowadays it's like I think it used to be good Charlotte was my main job and art was my side job but for the most part art is my main job now and mm -hmm. good Charlotte's kind of my side job at this point which is kind of crazy but it is what it is you know you know I'm sure that having you know being the guy from good Charlotte probably helped get in the door in some Absolutely, situations sure, yes. but, but that, visual but, art right. so I, I, I was a graphic designer for like you know 10 years and yeah I've heard you visual talk about art that. of is any is one of these things where it's like you can't fake that you know what i mean like your name might get you on the door but once you yep. show them your portfolio it's like if you suck it's obvious and nobody is going to want to work with you yes so very true. you know the fact that you've been able and nobody's going to trust you with star wars or spider-man just because you were in some band that sold a bunch of records exactly so you know the fact that you have been able to climb the ladder like that it you know speaks for itself well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it. You know, like I said, when I wake up and, and get to like, pay, like you said, new metal paid for your house, you know, and same, like <laughs> everything I have in my life is paid for either drawing or making music. And and I think about that all the time. Like, it's crazy. You know, like that's yeah. the kind of thing you dream about for, since you're a kid and I'm, I'm 42 now. And like, I'm, I have, you know, I didn't have to get another job. Like that's still what I've done my whole life. Like it's, it's still going and that's still how I support my family. And I'm, I'm very thankful for it. I mean, it's so incredibly hard to have success at even one of those things at like, even like a mediocre level is hard, you know, to have the kind of like really high level success that you have is really, I mean, I, I don't know that there's anybody else that's done it. I know Gerard Way has, has done some of that stuff, but I can't sure. really think of too many people. Yeah, no, I mean, a couple of people, I think is someone like Rob Zombie, who's had a really good movie right, directing right, yep. career. Like, that's yep. someone I look up to a lot. Like, okay, he wanted to pivot to do something else, and he did it really well. Yep. He's also been a very visual, creative guy throughout his whole music industry. Um, yeah, but like, yeah, Gerard is someone, too, you know, that's in comics. Uh, what's his name from Coheed? Um, I can't think oh, of Oh, yeah, Claudio. You know, he, he's a comics guy. So there's a couple guys here and there that I'll, I'll see at Comic-Cons who's like other, other musicians uh, who are, you know, big comic guys and stuff like that, so... I like I like to see that, and uh, I just think it comes down to hard work and uh, just 
don't do I don't really do much else. You know what I mean? Like I sit in my room all day. That's why I love your videos. Like you get lonely sitting in a room drawing all day. I listen sure. to the same records over and over. And I'm like, oh, I can't listen to this anymore. I need like human interaction. And like I stumbled across your videos maybe like a year ago. And and every time there's not a new Finn video, I'm like, oh, what am I going to start my like? I like hearing the conversation, the conversation. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of hours, you know, just like people are like, how do you get good at guitar? I'm like, sit in a room for like three months and do nothing else but play guitar yeah. all day, every day. You're probably going to get better at it. You know, when your friend says, let's go out on Friday night, you say, I can't go out. I'm doing something else, you know, make sacrifices. You have to like focus on your craft if you want to get good. Especially too, drawing is so hard and there is no shortcut. Like even if you're naturally talented, like it just takes hours and hours and hours and hours. And like, I mean, just like learning how to draw literally a thumb. Sure. It's like, I still, I'm years. still learning, you know, like I'm still there. Like if anyone ever gets complacent in their artistic career, like you're failing because there's always someone who's better than you. There's always a new tool or a new skill or something you can learn. So I'm, I'm always still trying to figure out how to get better, how to get better. It's, it's, it's constant. And it's kind of the same thing as music. I think like with visual art, the new generation is always coming along and doing stuff that, you know, nobody else would have ever th that the older generation, at least for me, I'm like, I would have never thought of that. I wouldn't have thought that was possible, you know, and some people react to that by getting threatened. But to me, that's inspiring of like, damn, I did not know you could do that on guitar, but uh, they've proven that you can. So they just up the ante. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm I'm always like a mix of the old and the new because I'm definitely not the like get off my lawn grandpa guy about, you know, new school stuff. I'm always like, oh, I want to learn about that stuff. But I look at stuff like AI. Right. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's going to take away a lot of jobs. Like that's frustrating to me because I know a lot of people who are really good and most businesses are going to be like, I don't care what the end result is. I want the right. best stuff for the least amount of money. And if the computer right. can do it less, that's that's who's going to get the job, you know? And yep. and I get that. So I'm thinking, okay, how do I use AI as a tool? You know? Okay. So I'm mostly a character designer. That's what I usually get hired for an animation stuff that I get designed to come up with the characters look like or do character art. But backgrounds, there's uh, they don't make me excited. Like I'm not excited about backgrounds. That's not something where I'm like, I, oh, mean, I can't wait who, to draw who this. Who wants to do that? Some people yeah. like there's some people in animation, they're background artists. They draw, yeah. they want to draw forests and cityscapes and like they love drawing the background. That's some people. But I would think, okay, maybe could I use AI? Give me 10 references of like a post-apocalyptic city or something like that. And it's going to come up with 10 really cool things that I could look at as a reference to draw instead of typing into Google and find the same 10, 10 images that every other artist out there has found, you know? Yeah. So maybe AI is like a tool to go alongside with the talented artists use, but people who are just going to type it in and be like, I'm an artist and then get their feelings hurt when real artists are like, you're not a real artist. You just typed a prompt in and they're like, I am, I'm just an AI artist. Yeah. I'm like, no, I, I, sorry. You know, like I put years and years and years into my craft is meant just like all these other people. So I'm, I'm not one who's going to get really mad and be like, you know, throw a fit like super anti AI it's here. It's not changing. It is what it yep. is. Learn it, understand it, figure out how you can work in and around it, you know, but uh, at the same time, I think those fundamental skills, I hope they will prevail in both music and in art. I hope that, you know, if you're truly talented at something that you're going to be able to come up with something better than a computer can just do by typing words in. But we'll see, because because right now is the worst it's ever going to be. And that's crazy. You know what I mean? Well, I think character design in particular, things like that, but but specifically character design, I think will always be valuable and is even more valuable now because that's the difference between basically generic AI puke that anybody can like barf out versus stuff that people love. Like how much is the character of Mario worth? Sure. Right. Billions. Yeah. Tens absolutely. of billions maybe, yeah. you know, like fill this, in the, any of these superhero properties, like an AI is not going to come up with those. No, like, and there's nuances in character designs when you're coming up with someone, like say whatever the, the kid is, you know, say you're coming up with like a kid and you think, okay, so that you think about in this movie, uh, this kid is kind of getting bullied a lot at school. So like maybe he puts like a slingshot in his pocket in the design because that's his way of feeling safe or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe this kid wears like um, a patch on a shirt from something because 
his dad was a firefighter who passed away and the patch reminds him of like how to be strong like his dad and like little things like that that when you see the character design they go over your head but then maybe at some point in the movie you're like oh he has this on because the story and the ai hasn't necessarily read the entire script and it doesn't know like the emotion or the background of the character sure you could type all that in maybe but i do think that like the human experience and the human connection to the character that you're creating is hopefully going to give you something that just that the other stuff won't that's exactly what i think i think that kind of human connection that's what people respond to and that's what is worth you know that's what generates all this value for companies and you know it's the stuff that ai it's just basically what ai is doing is removing some of the barriers between an idea and the execution yeah and what that does is make ideas more valuable than ever in a world where Lots of people can, you know, with AI, lots of people can execute. So pretend everybody can draw really well. Well, what else do you bring to the table? Sure. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So I just, just like anything, when something is new and shiny, everybody wants to check it out and it becomes this big thing and everybody talks about it. And then hopefully like, then it starts to become like a little more of like a normal everyday tool instead of this thing that people are obsessed with and like, you see trends come and go all the time, you know, and, and it's, it's it's like you take a sponge, you scoop it all up and then you wring it out and you're like, OK, here's what's left. Here's the good stuff. And then we got rid of all the rest of it. So, um, you know, just kind of wait and see where it goes. There's another thing there which I'm a strong believer in. I, I would like to know what you think about this for creative people. I think um, it's very important to specialize. And so in regard to art, you have specialized in character design. So you hear some people say like, oh, well, you know, I do 3D and I do motion graphics and I do illustration and I'm a graphic designer. I'm like, dude, any one of those things is incredibly difficult to get good at. There is zero chance you're going to be world class at any of them. You should pick one and focus on it as narrowly as possible. And a lot of people don't like to hear that because as creative people, we all kind of want to be able to do lots of stuff. But sure. I believe that it's almost always better to specialize. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I definitely know that you're right, but I struggle with it. You know, um, <laughs> I agree. I mean, right here, I think if I only focused on music, like how much farther would I be as a musician? You know, like if I was focused all my time just as producing, would I have way more albums out and be way more successful on the producing side? But, or vice versa, you know, if I only did art every day, would I have multiple movies out that like I create, you know, like did, like, would I be even farther? But I'm constantly torn between the two because I just love both. So, um, but here's the difference for you is you didn't start putting energy, more energy into art until you had already sort of achieved success in music and so that i think that's the key is like sure you can do anything Focus you want you just can't do right. them all at once because for a couple of years there when good charlotte first started out i there was nothing else you know like exactly you know i'm i'm like a really big uh nba fan basketball it's like a huge part of my life like all growing up i love basketball right now like basketball i'm obsessed but from like 2000 to 2002 there's like a dead space in my mind of basketball because I just stopped, right. you know, like I didn't watch basketball for two years. I didn't draw like it was just only guitar and only music and only how do we get this band going? Tunnel vision focused on the band. And then you're right. Then it hit and you started to get some success and then maybe there's room. So I guess you're right. At some point, you got to pick something and just really, really focus on it. Um, and At least like for said, a while. Yeah. And in the art world. Right. I I haven't gone from all over the place. Like I draw cartoons and comics. Like that's what I draw. Like I don't try to draw real life, still life. I don't try to be a portrait artist. I, I I found like my niche in the art world of what I like to do. And and that's what I focused on. So I do think there is something to that, but a lot of times, you know, I'll go in and see like, Oh, DreamWorks is hiring for a character designer. Like maybe I should submit for this, you know? And, 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 you know, even though I've had success, like I still submit resumes, like I'm just, you know, some kid right out of college looking for a job because that's how you find work sometimes. You know, I, yeah. I still submit stuff all the time. I don't mention anything about Good Charlotte in the resume. Like, I don't because mm-hmm. I think a lot of people would think, oh, he's too busy. He can't work here. He's in Good Charlotte. You know, like, so so sure. I don't say anything. And I've definitely had companies hire me having no idea. Like, they, and, oh, wow. you know, and like, someone's had people come back to me like three years, like, dude, you worked on this thing for three years ago. You're in Good Charlotte. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, <laughs> I had no idea. I'm like, because I think that, it's a deterrent in most of the time, you know, so. And your um, work as an artist should speak for itself. Exactly. So, but, but a lot of times I'll go in for the job and it will say character designer. And here's, here's what you need to know that you can do. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. And then it's like 
3D modeling is a plus. And I'm like, ooh, I'm not a three, you know, like, so do I need, do I need to learn how to do 3D modeling? And so I do think that at some point, having more skills gets you more jobs, you know, gets you more opportunity. Yeah. But I'm also not trying to be like, well, I should learn web design too, because that's a visual right. thing. Like that's, that's too far removed. Right. But, you know, right. kind of have this thing and then expand your bag a little bit until you, like learning you, how to make trap beats. Sure. Exactly. I'm still making music. You know what I mean? I wasn't, uh, and I also felt like that's part of popular music. Like I make pop music, whether it's rock or hip hop, you know, I didn't want to learn, you know, just some really avant-garde style of music and think I could turn that into pop. I mean, sure, maybe you can, but like you said, like it wasn't too far removed from what I was already doing. Yeah. And I guess the reason why I'm pointing out, pointing this out is because I think that one of the biggest things that creative people struggle with is focus for obvious reasons, because these are like, you know, creative people that sort of want to, this is who they are, is they want to explore lots of things and like, that's cool. And I get that. But I think more often than not, like people kind of need to be reined in a little bit. Um, and as much as they don't want to hear that, I think that that would help them. Yeah. You know, I, I tried, especially during COVID, we all did. You know, I was streaming on Twitch and tried to get my YouTube game going, all that, because there was nothing else to do. I was like, I'm just going to sit yeah. here and make content. And it was really frustrating, you know, because some days I would post a video of drawing. Some days I would post like some some beats and stuff like that. I'm like, why can't my stuff get traction? And like I started reading about trying to learn SEO and how YouTube works. And I was like, oh, I have to post the same video three times a week over and over yes. for like two years to f maybe get some traction. And I'm like, I can't. That's boring. Like, I would hate that. Like, I, I want to grind. Output, right. Yep. But the guys who do it, it pays off. You know what I mean? You have to find you have to find that little niche content. And. I probably haven't updated uploaded in YouTube for a while because I came to the realization that my passion is creating stuff. It's not it's not editing videos. It's not making YouTube. It, we all went crazy during COVID. I'm like, what the hell are we going to do? Like, I got to do totally. I mean, here. you didn't um, know if what was going to happen. In yeah. The next so it was it was a good outlet to connect with fans on Twitch and like talk, you know, and just like keep stay active. But now that, you know, the world is open back up again, I've been like, OK, I don't. I don't really necessarily need that outlet the same. I, I like streaming once in a while, but it was a lot of work. Like, like, you know, setting up the light and the microphone and pulling the green screen out yeah. and getting it. And I was like, Oh my God, it takes me in. Like by the time I set up, I'm like, I don't feel like drawing anymore. So, uh, but like, yeah, like you said, it's, it's the, the people who are all over the place. You're not going to benefit like the people who are focused. It's key. It really is. So what would your advice be for someone who is a visual artist of any kind, but let's, let's just say like someone who wants to do kind of comic book type art like you do for someone who wants to get their foot in the door, they think they've got the skills, but they're kind of just struggling to get anybody to pay attention to them. What's your advice for that person? The first thing I would say is like, actually do it, like make a comic book. Because so many people are like good at drawing and they can show that they're and they're waiting for that opportunity to get to draw a comic book, but they're not going to hire you to draw the comic book until they can see that you can draw a comic book. So like, yeah, make your own, you know, and guess what? The first one's probably going to be really bad. Second one's probably going to be really bad, too. You know what I mean? Just like when you say in music, the first song you write is not going to be good. You probably got to get 50 bad songs out until you're like, oh, this song's kind of good. If you want to work in comics start making comics draw like little eight to ten page comics like find someone who's an aspiring writer like find other people just show people that you can do it because how many times do you draw like these cool poses where like the guy's on the building with his hand on his hips and the capes flapping he looks all cool and then you get hired for marvel and the first panel is a guy sitting is in a science lab from the back and i'm like i have to draw someone sitting in a chair from the back like i've never what? drawn that that's so hard in yep. a science lab i've got to draw yep. all these beakers and you're like Oh, I thought it was going to be like fight scenes and like, no, like you get, you get a script. I remember like I worked That's on Ninja two pages, right? Like I got a Ninja Turtles script one time. And one of the first things was like the turtles enter the sewer and they're jumping over a turnstile. I was like, I, I got to look oh. up what a turn. Like I know what a turnstile is, but I don't, I don't, that's not in my like memory of uh, how to draw a turnstile. And so, so much of comics is there's no rule. Like anything can be thrown in the script at any point. And you have to know how to draw everything in comic books because yeah. you don't know what you're going to get handed. And you need to be able to draw it from every weird angle because when people have a conversation, you know, they don't both face the camera, you know, and it will look really weird right. if they're facing this, like they're going to look like, like, you know what I mean? Like someone's going to be the back and something like the, the angles are going to be weird and you don't practice drawing people from the back. And you like, that's just not like a glamorous, fun thing to draw. So yep. I think when you sit down to start making a comic book for the first time, you start hitting roadblocks right away and you realize like, 
oh shit, this is hard. Like I I don't know how to draw this. So if you want to break in, just start doing it. Like get all that, get all the embarrassing stuff that you don't want people to see out of the way. And eventually you'll start to learn and your craft will get better. And then you'll, you're going to go to Marvel. And like a lot of times at Comic-Cons, they do portfolio reviews where Marvel will sit there and the editors will go and you have to wait in line for like three hours and you show them your work. Like, do you want to show them that very first comic book that you drew? No, because you're not going to get work. So like get all those out into the point where you've got work that you're proud of that you could show someone. And maybe you're already at that point, Um, but get out there and do stuff. Like if you live in, Iowa in the middle of nowhere and you're not like at San Diego Comic-Con or New York Comic-Con, maybe you got to make a trip to San Diego. You know what I mean? Maybe you got to go out and put yourself in front of the people and uh, don't wait for things to come to you. You kind of got to go out there, put your work online, like go, you know, make an art portfolio. So someone's like, oh, you're an artist. Be like, here's my stuff. Like point them to it. You can't be like, oh, I've got a book at home. I could show you. No, like have your stuff, like be available, like show people your work and you got to be a little bit more proactive. Yeah, nobody wants to hire you to do something for the first time. Yes. And even you, you know, show them they've already done it. With with anything, even as like I said, I've been trying to get into this whole like um composing for movie and games. And and people would think, uh, so I met with an agent, you know, who who managed all these big composers, you know, and I, I said, Hey, I'm looking for an agent. I want and he said, Cool, like, have you done anything? And I was like, Well, no, I've got all these like songs that sound like movie score stuff. And he's like, But have you ever put it to film? Right. Like, no. And he's like, well, probably going to be the same experience to drawing someone from behind for the first time. You're like, oh, I didn't think of that. And I thought, well, I'm 23 years in the music industry. I've sold millions of records and I've, I know music. Like I'm a professional. He's like, I believe you. And he's like, and I listen to your music and it's good. I know you're good, but you haven't done it. And I'm like, okay. He's like, find a young filmmaker, find a friend, reach out, like put your music to video and then come back to me. And I thought, okay, so interesting that even, even at a professional level, no one's going to hire you for the first time. If you haven't done it, you got to figure out how to do stuff yourself and like get all grind to like do all, do all the boring stuff when no one's looking, get all the bad stuff out and then be ready to present it. Like when you're ready. So I think that's a good step of advice is don't wait for anything. Just start doing it. You mentioned being able to draw stuff from all these different angles and stuff like that. When I was a kid, I was really into the old EC comic stuff like tales from the crypt and all yeah. that kind of thing. Those guys were such fucking incredible draftsmen. Absolutely. And they didn't have Google images. No. So, and some you know, of it was, was black and white too in those things. You know, you couldn't make it look pretty with it. colors. You yeah. know, like it was just the draftsmanship. Yeah. And and they would have these, you know, files and files of just reference images. So if they have to yeah. draw an oil tanker, well, they can't hop on Google images. They got to go right. find a picture in a magazine or something. And, you know, the level of craft that those guys had doing it all by hand um with you know brushes and ink and basically someone you know putting a gun to their head and telling them this needs to be done by Tuesday you know is just i just have so much respect for that kind of old school grind absolutely i mean comic books are 22 pages in a cover that's a monthly comic book so these guys who work like on monthly books for marvel or dc or something they're literally doing 23 like full pages a month you know so that gives you seven days you know roughly that maybe you could take off otherwise like i know it takes me and i couldn't do that like for me it's usually a day and a half to two days i could get like a patient like i just can't crank it out at that rate but the guys who do it they do like a full eight hour they you know they're waking up at 6 a.m they're doing an eight hour day taking a little break then you know maybe eating dinner and then going back from like nine till two a.m you know working again and then waking up and sleeping for four hours and starting over and doing it again and like they are just grinding all day long and there's not much money in comic books you know comic books is right. not like it like you if you're drawing comic books like that it's because you love it and you live it and it's your life and you've dreamed forever about working in comics because it's it is and that's why i see some guys start shifting into like video game concept concept art or animation because it's less drawing and it pays more you know so like there's people who do those comics show give them their flowers give them the respect because they're working their butts off because they truly love what they're doing I have a ton of respect for people who can do good work fast. And like, to me, that's the real measure of how good a visual artist is. Is like, it's one thing if you take three months to make your masterpiece, like that's cool. I respect that too. But what I really, really respect is people who can grind out work. That's like very good, very quickly when they're not feeling inspired. Yeah. Um, And I definitely think that's like a little bit, you know, like people talk about flow state and stuff like that. Like there's definitely times where I've been working on the same project for weeks at a time 
and like I'm just in the zone and I'm I'm drawing, I'm like, oh, everything's coming out good. And like I just see it in my head and it comes out right and I'm working at a fast pace and I'm excited. And then there's times maybe when you're starting on a new project or or mentally I'm focused on something else, something else is going on in life outside of what I'm working on. And like maybe I'm not fully checked in and you're sitting and you're trying to draw and you're like, it's just not coming out. And you, you, yeah. you're like, and, and that's the thing with creative work is that you're checking in from nine to five and you have to be creative. Like you can't be creative when it hits, you know, you have to be creative now. This is work time. Come up with good ideas. So both music and art, it's, (laughs) it's, uh, you know, there'll be times my wife and I are like watching a movie, you know, and I'll, uh, I'll be watching it, but my brain is somewhere else. And then I'll be like, hang on a second. She's like, what? I'm like, I gotta go like, just put this thing down on guitar real quick. Cause I hear this thing over and over in my head. And I'm like, if I don't put it like a little phone recording of it right now, like I'm not going to remember it. And sometimes like creativity, like it strikes at the weirdest times. And then sometimes you sit down in your computer and you're like, okay, time to be creative now. And you're like, but I can't, you know, it's just not there. So yep. it's a weird job when, when you have to be creative, but I don't want to complain because I can't, I'm like, I'm good at nothing else. People are like, it's not fair that you're good at music and art. I'm like, yeah, but that's it. Like if my car breaks, I'm like, something breaks in can't my house. My shoes. Like, right. Like anything goes wrong in that, any other thing. I'm like. I can't. I have I'm I'm only know how to do these things. That's it. Cool. Well, that sounds like a good note to end it on to me. I uh, appreciate your time. Of course, and, man. I'm uh, so happy to be on here. Thank you for everything you do, man. I appreciate your content. You you're one of the best guys out there as far as just being knowledgeable about the music industry. I'm I'm very thankful for your success too. I'm humbled. Thank you.